the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can And we have a special treat. Our, uh, our musical ensemble is going to do an end for us. And I, get, I forgot to put the offertory on the order of service. Can you believe that? Well, we haven't been doing it for a while. So if anybody wants to take up an offering, this will be the opportunity to do that. Otherwise, we're just going to enjoy the beautiful music. <laughs> sick. Lord, help us to pray in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. 
Lord, we pray especially today for our brother Burnley, who's had a car crash just this morning on his way to worship. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would bless him, bless the other party involved in the accident. Lord, that, that no one would come to harm. Uh, Lord, we pray for others who are hurting, others who have been injured, others who are sick. Lord, we pray for those who are caregivers for the sick. We pray for our doctors and our nurses who work so hard to keep all of us well. Lord, we pray that you would bless those who need to know Christ or to know Him better. We would be bold to pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on all of those, Lord, who need to come to Christ. And we pray that you would help us as we seek to, uh, to spread the gospel. And as we open your word, teach us, O oh Lord, to understand what you have to say to us so that we might be better servants of you and we might uh, draw others into this wonderful fellowship that you have granted to us. And we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we come today to the end of Matthew chapter 28. But we're not coming to the end of the gospel because we skipped a few chapters. We have to go back and start on that next week. But this is the end of the gospel, and it's the beginning of our work. Now that Christ has risen, we uh, come to an understanding that he is calling us to bless others with this good news. So, Matthew 28, the verses 16 through 20, you find the reading inside your order of service. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That is God's word for us. May he add his blessing to us as we meditate upon it today. And it was almost exactly ten years ago, it was in the month of May, 2012, that... Yakina and First Port Gibson became part of the then Central South Presbytery, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. It's been 10 years. So what difference has that made to us? Well, to be honest, probably not a lot. I mean, both before and after that uh, momentous occasion, both of our congregations have been known for, well, several things. Our beautiful historic sanctuaries, right on Highway 61, where everybody knows where they are. We've been known for the long tenures of our pastors. We've been known for a great sense of unity and fellowship among our members. And as events like today's picnic so clearly demonstrate, Mississippi folk in general, and Mississippi Presbyterians in particular, tend to be hospitable and friendly. And that's always been true at Yachna and at first Port Gibson. Whether we were part of the PCUS or the PCUSA or the EPC, we've always prayed for each other. We have always cared for each other when we're sick, when we're hurting, when we're grieving. We've always known each other's business. We've always been up in each other's business. And that's a good thing most of the time because we take care of each other. We rejoice with each other at weddings. We grieve with each other at funerals. We're always ready to reach out to those in need, to share the blessings that God has given to us. That hasn't changed, and I pray it never will. But let's face it, over these last 10 years, both of our churches still are surrounded by communities that have a lot of problems. Yes, we're a, friendly, we're a friendly congregation. Yes, we have lots of goodwill. Yes, we're welcoming. Yes, everybody knows where our churches are. Oh, you have that little white church on the highway just as you get in? Oh, I know that church. Oh, you have that church? Oh, I know that church. Every 
everybody knows where we are. But let's face it, we got plenty of seats available on Sunday morning. We could double the number in regular attendance and still be able to social distance, right? And don't all of us know folk who don't belong to a congregation? Don't all of us know folks who don't profess faith in Christ? Or who perhaps don't act very much like Christians? Don't worry about it. Just focus. <laughs> Mine will probably go off in a minute. <laughs> so while we have a lot of blessings, and we celebrate those blessings today, there is a lot of work that needs to be done all around us. And in today's passage, we hear Jesus call for all of us to get busy. He tells us to go into where? All the nations with the good news of the gospel. And he tells us this because all authority in heaven and on earth is given into the hands of Christ. That means there's no one who doesn't need to hear the truth. There's no one who doesn't need to bow the knee to Christ. Because of Jesus' death, because of his resurrection, because of his ascension into heaven, we know he is not a way, he is the way of salvation. We have a story to tell to the nations that everybody needs to hear. And Jesus wants all of us to proclaim it. That much is clear. But we have to understand that even in our modern era of electronic communication, spreading the gospel involves more than just posting sermons on websites or live streaming our worship services on YouTube and Facebook. That's all helpful. But notice in verse 20, Jesus tells us to teach all that he has commanded us. All. Few letters. Big concept. And if we're going to teach all of Jesus' commandments, that means we can't leave anything out. That means we're called into a fuller, a more consistent <coughs> communion with Christ. So we have to have a deeper understanding of his word so that we can teach it all, so that we can share it all in a comprehensive way. That means we need to devote ourselves to earnest, thorough study of the scriptures. We need to learn what the Bible says because it has a lot to say about the real problems that real people have in the real world. Because it's only when we know God's Word more fully that we will be able to help each other apply it more accurately to our lives. So the Christian life is about being a disciple. The Christian life is about learning. It's about teaching. But it's also about living. Living in a real relationship with God and a real relationship with one another. That's why Jesus doesn't tell us to teach students. He tells us to make disciples, followers of Christ. And what does that include? Well, a lot of things. It includes what he mentions, administering the sign of baptism, which is the initiation into our covenant community. Baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we can't stop there. Discipleship doesn't stop at the font. We don't just follow Jesus down the aisle and say the sinner's prayer. We have to follow him back to our seat and then outside the church doors and into our communities. If we're going to make disciples, we have to be disciples. We have to know his word. And we have to live his life as individuals, as congregations, and in our community, we have to display the Spirit of Christ to everyone around us. If we want folks to join us, they're going to have to see Jesus in us. Now, it's true that the presbytery, the denomination to which congregations belong, can make a big difference. They can help or hinder how we go about making disciples. And I hope over the last 10 years we've learned about some of the resources the EPC has to offer us that wonderful modern English version of the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms. And studying that, studying our, our denominational standards, that summary of Christian teaching 
and look at all those scripture texts. That helps us to learn and to know what Jesus wants us to know. And since our presbytery was formed in 2014, we've gotten involved in a lot of ministries, haven't we? Our presbytery has joined together to plant churches from New Orleans to New Braunfels. We've helped storm victims every year, right? Just not whether there's going to be a storm, which one and where is it? From Homa to Houston, we've helped. We've nurtured many candidates who've gone on to fill pulpits across our presbytery and across our denomination. And I hope that you get a chance to go to a presbytery meeting and hear some of these young people as they articulate their faith and as they demonstrate their deep knowledge of the scriptures. It is truly encouraging. We've helped Genesis Church in Mercedes to raise funds for a new house of worship, and they were finally able to break ground this month. Last month now. And we've joined with our friends in the Presbytery of the Central South who help out the Engage 2025 project as we send missionaries to work in the Middle East. But no denomination, no Presbytery can do the day-to-day -day work of discipleship. That's for the local congregation. That's for all of us Christians to do. Jesus calls us. He doesn't call our denomination. He doesn't call our Presbytery. He calls us to go into the world to make disciples of those around us, to enter into relationship with those who are lost in order that they might be found, in order that we might share the good news, the good news that Jesus is the Savior of sinners. And in order to do that, in order to share the good news, we not only need to know it, we need Christ to live in us. We need Christ's life to be lived through us. We need His life of self-sacrifice and humble service. That's what the world needs to see. That's what the world needs to know. They need to see Christ and know that He is real. That's a tall order. But that's why Jesus concludes the passage the way that he does. Because we're not in this by ourselves. It's not just us as a group. It's not just our presbyteries. It's not just our denomination. It's not just the worldwide church. Jesus promises he will be with us even as he sends us to be with others and to help them understand the truth. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus promises to empower our words. He promises to give our message credibility as our lives give that message credibility as we become more and more like Christ each and every day. It was 10 years ago that our denomination changed, our presbytery changed. We became Evangelical Presbyterians, capital E, capital P. But what if over the next 10 years we become lowercase e, Presbyterians, if we get busy about the evangel, the good news, and sharing that with others? What if we become more serious about our own walk with Christ? What if we become more focused on learning and growing in our faith? What if over the next 10 years, we evangelical Presbyterians get busy evangelizing, <coughs> telling one another the good news, showing and sharing the love of Christ <coughs> with each other, and with those around us, with all those who need Christ or who need more of Him in their lives. What difference might our two congregations make in Claiborne and Warren counties over the next 10 years if we become evangelical Presbyterians? And how might we take part in the mission of the church? The church throughout the world, the church throughout the ages, as we spread the good news that Jesus Christ saves sinners and that he rules and he reigns over all. For he does, you know, rule and reign over all. And that's what our closing hymn reminds us, that he reigns where e'er the sun does his successive journeys run. We'll sing all, but it's only got four stanzas, Jan, it's only four. Uh, we'll do it. Jesus.